there's a little corner of America where visions evolve, where diversity is encouraged, where creativity and technology don't fight. They go hand in hand, walking down the street, singing songs together, and maybe the neighbors shout, shut the fuck up, it's 4 a.m. Or maybe they don't. It's in this little corner of America where one man leads from the front, curating, collaborating, choreographering, though probably not in the literal sense of the word, creating a variety of work from mobile applications to TV spots for brands that most of us would be too ill-disciplined to handle. In this little corner of America, the one man has seen the future and he's working out how to make it happen. Whoopi Goldberg is Nick Law in A Gum Tree Grows in Brooklyn. In a borough without chicka rolls, one Aussie stands tall. Um, let me just take some of this. I already need to do a piss. I can never get the balance right between <laughs> keeping my mouth like moist and my, uh, and my bladder empty. I can't get it right. They should have like bedpans for the stage. <laughs> I think Bob Greenberg is going to invent one of them. I can feel it coming on. Anyway, um, I'm Nick Law and as was mentioned, this is the, uh, the topic of my of my talk. You know, they ask you to come up with a topic for these things months before you come, and you tend to change your mind about you want, what you want to speak about in the sort of time it takes to actually put the thing together. But I've stayed true to this. I'm going to talk less about the creative team, pull back a little bit, and talk about the industry at whole, I think. Um, but it, what made me think about this sort of relationship between Madison Avenue and Silicon Valley, or to be sort of more specific between advertising and software was, <clears throat> I actually went to and, uh, and pitched some venture capitalists in, uh, in Silicon Valley about a year ago, and it was a curious experience. I mean, I've been involved with soft software development for a while, but mostly for marketers, <clears throat> and I sort of suspected that it would be different, but it was so much different. I put together this presentation, which if I'd presented to any of my advertising clients, they would have bought it. I know they would have bought it. Because what happens is advertising clients, they buy, buy, buy ideas. They buy ideas because they know that the production of those ideas is sort of templated. We've been doing it for 50 years. If the idea is pretty good, we'll just get Smuggler and you know, Fincher will direct it. I'll go and get some, some craft services, sit in the sand for a bit, and it'll be fine. And this is so, so when you buy a, an idea in, a, in the advertising world, you're buying the final product mostly. Now, this is not true of Silicon Valley. And this presentation, which I thought was brilliantly conceived, lovely design, nice use of type, a bold sans serif. <laughs> um, in the end, the, uh, the VC people sort of stared blankly at the team that was selling this sort of software idea and said, um, have you built this? And no, we're selling you an idea. Well, come back when you've built it and come back with the engineer. We don't buy ideas because in Silicon Valley, there are just, there are ideas like arseholes. They're everywhere. <laughs> the difficult piece is actually making it. So I recognize, and I've, I knew before that, obviously, because uh, as, I, as I said, we've been developing software for a while with, with RGA, but there, it's a very different culture. It's a different world. Uh, advertising is full of people with baseball caps on backwards, high-fiving each other, having great meetings, and having, uh, and Silicon Valley is full of very lonely men. You know, hunched over computers, eating pop tarts all night. So, so there's this sort of this sort of cultural dissonance between the two worlds. Uh, but it's not going to. It can't last because, as we know, uh, there's already been an industry that met software. Um, it was a while ago. It was the first industry really to meet software, and we know how that ended up. <clears throat> and it's a little bit of a. Uh, you know, you can look back to look forward. I think there are a few things to learn from that, what happened. Um, but the reason that, that music was the first industry to, to get uh, destroyed by software was because the file that is a music file is the smallest file. So it's the easiest one to share. 
So between the moment that Napster started to erode the CD market to when iTunes emerged and started to actually uh, sell online, there was four years. And in that four years, the music industry fucked it. They didn't realize that they weren't selling CDs, they were selling music. They weren't selling the object, they were selling the experience. And in that four years, all they tried to do was to defend the object, which is a CD. And so now, the industry is half as big as it was 10 years ago. Now, some would argue that the music is actually richer than it's ever been. You can get more music from more artists. It's so much easier to make. But the industry is, is in, is, has been halved. So I'm going to do a little cautionary tale here by going to the past to look at the future again. Um, because I think that it's... it's you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the future, and I just want to qualify it by saying that none of us really know the future, and even those people inventing the future don't know the future. Here's an example. I was digging through the New York Times in the archives, and I found this wonderful um, uh, piece, which was a little bit was like the equivalent of, of, a, of a leak of an Apple product for the time. So Edison's wonderful phonograph, which was being developed in Menlo Park um, in, in, uh, in the 1880s, the Times got word of it, and they speculated about what this phonograph would be. And so it's a long and, and very sort of flowery uh, article. Well, let me just read out what they thought that this phonograph would be useful for. And, and I'm guessing that they got this from Edison himself, right? Confidential or business letters may be dictated without the inter intervention of, uh, uh, of writing. Two copies may be made at once and one retained by the sender, and duplicates may be produced at will. The matter may also be dictated to be put in print and typesetted. Uh, may hear the words distinctly uttered instead of having to struggle with bad copy. Books may be read into the phonograph by trained elocutionists. Copies may be multiplied, and the effect of reading may be enjoyed in the sick chamber or the drawing room, while the hands and the eyes of the hearer are employed at something else. The machine may, may also be used an as an auxiliary in the schoolroom, in training children to read properly without the personal attention of a teacher, in teaching them to spell correctly and in covering any lessons to be acquired by study and memory. In short, a school may also be conducted by machinery. The instrument may also be used to preserve the sayings and speeches and voices, even the last words of friends or of distinguished persons. Not only may books be read by means of the phonograph, but a volume of 40,000 words may be preserved on a sheet 10 inches square, it's 10,000 songs in your pocket, and libraries collected and enjoyed without the effort usually required in reading. Songs and music may be kept on tap as it were, dolls and other toys may be made to talk and laugh and cry, clocks may not only tell the hour but call us up in the morning, summon us to dinner and send us to be, it goes on and on and on. As his final triumph, so he, and it, he, he makes this connection with the, with the telephone which he invented in the phonograph. As a, so, out of all of those things, you know, there was a little side comment about songs, but the person that invented the future didn't really predict the use of it. So, so I think that's a sort of cautionary tale. If we go up to 2003, when, uh, when Apple started to eat up the music industry, and now it is obviously the largest music company in the world, this was the logo that they, they came up with, right? And it was originally a piece of software that, uh, that, where you ripped your CD. Now, Jobs couldn't imagine what iTunes would become because it, not only was it, did it become more than just something that would rip CDs, but it became a channel not just for music, but for media, right? So, um, so when music met soft, meets software, it becomes more than music. So just as, as, uh, as Edison wasn't very good at recognizing the object from the experience, so too uh, the music industry couldn't recognize that once it became software, it became something else completely different. Now, this is going to be something from a media point of view that, that we're going to become very familiar with. We know what's happening with the publishing industry since Met Software. Um, uh, a great example would be Borders. I mean, it's not just, when I say publishing, it's magazines, it's newspapers, but book retailers like Borders, they had the chance to buy Amazon early on and, and, and chose not to because they thought it would be too tactical. Um, and they, they actually they liquidated all their assets, uh, I think, at the end of last year. Um, and if you compare, like, the, the largest bookseller in the world now is Amazon. It's a software company. And it doesn't just sell books. It sells a lot of other things. Um, 
when photography met software, then we know what happened then too, right? So Kodak uh, filed for bankruptcy in January this year. I'm surprised they lasted that long. Uh, and and what, what Kodak's world has been replaced with is, is a suite of things. It's mostly, you know, Kodak invented the handheld camera. Now we all have cameras and they're, they're part of a, a, a larger sort of suite of experiences that we carry around our pocket. Um, but they also thought that they were in the film industry. That's what Kodak thought they were in the film industry. They didn't recognize that they're in the imaging industry. So just recognizing what industry you're, industry you're in and, and trying to protect the object and not the experience has been sort of led to the downfall of all of these things, right? So I guess in, in some sort of summation of this little, little rant, all media is software. And it's important to distinguish the qualities of software, software because the reason that that when media and when all these other industries I'm about to talk about become uh, sort of enmeshed in software, why they, then changes become very malleable and where we can't predict where it's going to go other than it's going to go somewhere fast is because software has two qualities which has changed media forever, right? First is it's networked. So every media experience you have is now one click away from another, right? And it's interactive. In front of all of our media now, there is an interface. Our TVs have got interfaces. You know, we, our life's interface more and more has become this thing, right? And so because we are manipulating the media, there's, there's less of a chance that media is going to manipulate us. Um, so, but it leads to the question, if, if all of these other industries fail to recognize what, what business they were in, I think I'm going to pause now and try to describe what business I think we're in, right? I think it's important to talk about media because our industry is about using media. We use media, right? And, and right from the very beginning, you know, when we, uh, we use media to get attention. And we got attention uh, so, so people would buy stuff. That's really our industry, right? So we use media to get attention so people to buy stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about attention for a little bit because I think it's interesting um, how media gets our attention and it's changing drastically. And as, as sort of McLuhan figured out very early is that the technology shapes us in very unexpected ways. Um, but, you know, uh, avatar, media is a part of culture and, and, and culture is our relationship um, with, with our consumer. It's a sort of cultural exchange and it always has been this sort of game. So the black dot is a company, the red dot is a consumer and, and they're figuring out what game they're going to play together and that game is the, the company's going to tell people about their product, right? And so the original game, if you go right back to before the, <clears throat> at the end of the 1880s, or the, uh, was advertising was information. That's really what it was. If you look at this early Johnson & Johnson ad, it's just purely descriptive. It's just information. Now, it's saying good things about the product, which is an antiseptic, but it's, look at all that text. It's just basically describing what the product is. That's what advertising was. And that currency of advertising, that exchange between the company and the, and, the, and the audience, the game, was really true to that right up until the 50s. It was about information, right? Now, sometimes the information was sort of branded like this one. And this was a long-running camel campaign, more Dr. Smoke camels than other cigarettes. Go to YouTube and look at the TV spots for this. They're fantastic. And look how much text is on there. And there's all these sort of... Uh, oh. Hang on a sec. I was trying to use the yeah. This thing here. See, this is the this is the sort of branded uh, tea spot, which is describing how it uh, keeps your, your your throat clear. Um, but it's information. It, this is a it, this is a bloody ad for a cigarette. Look at all the information, and it's authoritative. Um, uh, and so, and, and this is. But it all changed in the '60s when Birnbach decided that it, you know, as as marketers, we could do more than that. What happened basically was that there were too many brands to describe them descriptively and, we, and to decommoditize the message, you had to entertain. So Birnbach figured that out and started to, uh, to entertain. And that is the model that we're still in now, I would argue, right up until the 80s, you know, in this, I remember the silk cut campaigns. Um, they're basically, the, the game that the company is playing with the audience there is decode this, have some fun. Take some time out of your day and try to figure out what we're trying to say. There's no information on this anymore. So it went from informational to complete sort of uh, uh, entertainment exchange. The only information on this ad is that 
cigarettes kill you. <laughs> right, so now we're at this point where I think the game is changing again. The game that marketers are playing with consumers is different. And it's largely because we are now consuming more media than ever, and we're mediating our experiences through screens, like here. Um, but, but, we're, but we're harder and harder to get to. So there is this sort of tension between the amount of media that we're consuming and our ability to actually get people interested and get their attention. Some serious controversy tonight around a new app for the iPhone, an app that is supposed to help men, quote, score. First of all, it's so stupid. They wanted attention, they got it. Shockingly, some people have found this disgusting and insulting. More proof that we really are a nation of children. The application encourages users who score to post details. The software is called Amp Up Before You Score, which is not a reference to basketball. What's happening to the men of America that you have to have an application to pick up women? Say you're doing what you shouldn't be doing, and you need a place to go. There's a girl for that. Or you followed her into a bookstore, and you need to act like you've read something, ever. It divides women into groups like nerd, rebound girl, or cougar. Here's one, I'm not really this tall, I'm sitting on my wallet. For the tree hugger, there's a live Twitter feed for every tweet that mentions carbon footprint. For the foreign exchange student, there's a New York Times list of international headlines. It's a fully immersive experience, which of course is the whole point of new media marketing. Yesterday, it had over 5,000 downloads in the first 24 hours. Is it a little offensive? Probably not. Is it edgy? Yes. I think it's pretty funny, but uh, I guess some people were offended by it. It's encouraging infidelity. Definitely very degrading. There were people that actually loved the application. They thought it was very entertaining. People who take stuff like that seriously are just looking for something to achieve. The controversial headlines distract from the point. In the end, the app is a big score for Pepsi's breakfast. It's a waste of time, frankly. It doesn't work because I've tried half of these lines back in the days when I was a bachelor. Rob, good to see you. Thank you very much. So we did that a few years ago. Pepsi pulled it immediately. But it got some attention. Here's another thing that got some attention. This past year, famine, war, and drought were devastating the Horn of Africa on an unprecedented scale. Yet the crisis remained under the radar. So the relief effort had to do two things generate awareness and donations quickly, and get people talking about it. FWD became a way to illustrate the crisis and spread the facts. It identified the problems, famine, war, drought, showed where it's happening, the Horn of Africa, and most importantly, gave people an immediate way to help by forwarding the facts, designed to be simple and shareable. We created TV, radio, online advertising, and a site where visitors can track the progress of shares. We also asked people with the largest social networks, celebrities, politicians, and even internet stars to forward the facts to all their millions of followers. Forward the facts to everyone you know. Those followers then shared the facts with their followers. Corporations joined the cause, garnering even more awareness and donations through their customers. The spread of relief peaked on November 9, 2011, with the launch of Forward Day, when everyone involved made a collective push to forward the facts. The goal of the single day event was 13 million shares, one for every person affected by the crisis. On that day, over 117 million shares were generated across Facebook, Twitter, and blog posts. Right now, over 13 million people are affected by famine, war, and drought in the Horn of Africa. The more people who know, the more money we can raise. And the more money we raise, the more people we can help. The efforts of the campaign paid off. On December 22nd, President Obama announced an additional $113 million in emergency relief assistance for the Horn of Africa. 
FWD proved that if enough people understand the problem and start talking about it, the government pays attention. As the campaign continues to gain momentum, so does awareness. And while the famine has officially ended, the crisis is far from over. Together, we're bringing relief to the Horn of Africa, one forward at a time. So, believe it or not, there are, there are things in common with those two things, even though one is for evil and one is for good. Um, in both cases, we were trying to circumvent mass media because mass media was being ignored, right? And uh, you, the, in the first case, it was by creating enough controversy that it would be picked up and, uh, and publicized without having to buy media. And in the second case, it was really about creating um, little uh, pyramids of social activity that would drive a message that the, that the mass media was ignoring because you had another famine in Africa. It wasn't newsworthy at the time. So we had to make sure people understood that the facts were pretty astounding and having known the facts to share them. So, but in both cases, what, what you need to do is to design media, right? Because there's all sorts of media nodes, uh, social media, um, you know, narrative media, uh, PR, all of these things are sort of uh, having to be engineered and designed as a sort of system. Um, so, and so if, if, if we're thinking about media now as opposed to attention, what we're thinking about is sort of designing a framework. So I'm going to go through this framework. Um, this is something that we've been using at RGA for a few years, and it's a good way. It's more, it's less, this is not theory, this is a model. This is how we actually make the media that we design work. And the nodes in all those sort of media moments are represented in this, in this continuum between a story and a system. And what I mean by a story is what you probably understand uh, advertising to be, which is telling brand messages, right? So there is still this sort of place where we must tell messages. What I mean by a system is, so since we live in this world covered by this sort of membrane of software, media is now a system in which we behave. So uh, as people that use media to reach uh, uh, an audience, we need to know how to create these systems, right? So we've got, we've got message, and behavior, and the relationship between those two things is very important. Besides, I love Venn diagrams. They're sort of rude, aren't they? In fact, these are rude too, come to think of it. Anyway, so what I'm gonna show is this relationship between story and system. And interestingly, you know, going back to Silicon Valley uh, and, and uh, Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue is peopled by creatives that process things as stories, right? We're all Hollywood wannabes, right? This is, this is true, that uh, uh, we think creativity in advertising is being able to tell a story. And the brain, when it tells a story, processes things one at a time. The systematic people, those lonely men with pocket holders and food in their beards, they think in systems. They've all got Asperger's and they're able to, they're able to process things all at once. This is a, this is a, in my sort of amateur um, neuroscience, this is, this is true, that part of the brain processes things one at a time, part of the brain processes things, processes things all at once. One is temporal, one is spatial. The trick is getting them together. That's the trick, that's the model, right? Because if you need a message and you need a system of behavior. And the relationship between those two things I'm now gonna describe as media moments. So again, I'm not gonna talk about the objects of media, the channels, I don't care about the channels. You know, Facebook could be Friendster. I don't care. I'm gonna to talk to you about the media moments, how we use media, right? So advertising has been about storytelling because it's been pushed out through storytelling mediums. So if you're gonna interrupt the footy, then you're gonna interrupt it on, you know, with, with some entertainment. If you're gonna interrupt I Love Lucy, you're gonna interrupt it with, with, some, with some filmic content. Um, and that is entertainment. So, and we've, we've mistakenly think that that is what the only thing that advertising is about. But now we know that there are all these other media moments. When the, when the internet emerged, it, it was really a place to share information. That is the currency of the, inf of the internet at the beginning. It was for scientists to share papers uh, and to share information. It still is often. We go and the first place we go to is the Google search box because we're after information. And there's a value in information. So one thing we need to sort of clear up is, is this miscomprehension our industry have, 
has, and that is that storytelling is about emotion, and this sort of systematic digital stuff is about rational stuff, and that's bullshit, right? Because if you have a, if I want to share the, um, uh, uh, the write the future video, I'm sharing entertainment, right? That widened it, and that's, and it has a life and a value and a social value because of that. But just as often, I want to share information. If I have a friend with a very particular disease, the most valuable currency that I can have in media is information, right? And, it, and it's a very emotional thing too. Now, more and more, when we talk about software, we talk about enablement. So media is now this thing that helps me get stuff done, right? So whether it's helping me transact or bank or connect with people, it's an enabling technology. It has an interface in front of it, it helps me do stuff. It's right in the center of that behavioral thing. Now, if you're going to build stuff like that, or if our clients are going to build stuff like that, whether we're helping them or not, then, then we need to think of a different way of telling a story because it's not just about entertaining, it becomes about demonstration. So the use of overblown metaphors and you know, anthemic ads become less useful if what you're trying to sell people on is an experience that has an interface. Now, Apple understood this. You know, when, they, when they first started to advertise this thing here, what they advertised was the interface. Right? When Steve Jobs showed us the, uh, the iPad, we understood immediately how to use it. The press conference was a more emotional moment because you looked at it and you knew how to use it. Your mirror neurons were engaged. You wanted to use it more than any, any ad. Any. Now, the intersection between a message and a, and, a, and a behavior or a story and a system is a very important thing. It's particularly important because, as I said, these two cultures of Madison Avenue and Silicon Valley are like oil and water. And so the opportunity for them to work together has been very scarce. And when, you, but when they do work together, what you get is these wonderful moments of play where you can create your own story within a system of behavior. Now, I'm going to show you some examples of that, um, but it's a very powerful thing. And there's a metaphor that I use to describe the difference between these three modes of storytelling, um, which sort of explains how cognitively these modes of storytelling uh, get deeper and deeper the closer you get to play. So as a Paleolithic man, if I'm a hunter and I'm trying to sell a behavior, right, which is the enablement, if I'm trying to sell the enablement to my son, I could use a metaphor in, and, and entertain him and say, when I killed that woolly mammoth, it was like killing the world. And my son would feel a bit of emotion. That's awesome, Dad. I'd like to kill a woody mammoth. I could, I could grab a spear and say, look, I could demonstrate it and say, this is how I killed the woolly mammoth. My son's mirror neurons are engaged. He's understanding it now. He's getting deeper into the experience. I could pass him the spear and say, pretend that rock is a woolly mammoth, and I've got him. This is why gaming has become a bigger industry than movies. Because as humans, we love agency. We like making things move. You, you, you want to see a two-year-old with an iPad? They can't help it. Even when a movie's playing, they can't help but, but, but stop it and, 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 uh, and interact with it because play is such an important thing. So our relationship to these media moments becomes very important too. We need to recognize that on the story end of the spectrum, our relationship to the media is as an audience. In the systematic end, we are your user. And in the middle, in the sweet spot of play, we're a participant. And just by definition, that means that we're more, more emotionally involved, right? So if you can set up moments of play, then that's really the most powerful sort of marketing. Uh, I think we've got a video coming up here. This year, the wallet became more than a wallet, and the way we pay changed forever. Introducing Google Wallet, a mobile app that makes your phone your wallet and holds things like credit cards, loyalty cards, and offers. To launch this new mobile payment system, we worked closely with Google to design, position, and brand the product, create the user experience, and then put it in people's hands. Wow. This is so cool. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. First, we named it. From there, we developed a wallet identity that showed how the product behaves. We also branded other wallet-related products, creating a suite of brands for the Google Commerce platform. We helped enhance the user experience and design of the mobile app and website, as well as the online presence for Google Offers, the low-price deals platform within Wallet. Finally, we created simple marketing kits to welcome participating merchants and educate them on accepting phone payments in-store. These efforts led to the Google Wallet launch event in New York. We worked closely with Google to create a... Whoa. 
Whoops. You get the idea. This year, the one. Oh, we're gonna go. Here's another one. On any night, Kobe Bryant can transform without warning into an unstoppable force. Black Mamba. What is Black Mamba all about? That's my alter ego. When you step on a basketball court, you gotta get into another frame of mind. It's about shifting and going into your zone. The Black Mamba. An alter ego beloved by fans and feared by the competition. We set out to mimic Kobe's physical transformation into the Black Mamba on NikeBasketball.com. So when Kobe transforms, the site transforms with him. Since fans routinely call out the Black Mamba on social networks, a custom-made Twitter algorithm was programmed to generate and monitor real-time global social chatter and transform the site using Kobe-related tweets as the trigger. Every time the Mamba struck, fan social chatter would cause the automated site to change from normal Kobe state to the Black Mamba state once 1,750 tweets per hour was surpassed. During each of these Mamba moments, the site would offer exclusive access to content for the next six hours, like Kobe video interviews, personalized wallpapers, and a chance for fans to win exclusive Nike ID Zoom Kobe 6 kicks. As Mamba moments grew closer, the traffic on NikeBasketball.com exploded as social chatter spread across the web. A real-time Twitter tracker showed fans exactly how many Kobe-related tweets were being posted at that moment, and how many were needed to transform the site and unlock the Mamba content. Fans around the world would watch the Twitter tracker live, waiting for the site to open its gates, working collectively to try and push the needle over the edge. Every time a Mamba moment happened, Nike Basketball spread the word with posts on social networks across the globe. As a special surprise for fans, a short film directed by Robert Rodriguez starring Trejo, Willis, Evil Kanye, and the Black Mamba himself dropped a couple days before All-Star Weekend, driving even more traffic to the site. Then at the All-Star Game on February 20th, Kobe Bryant scored a game-high 37 points en route to winning his fourth career All-Star MVP award. Global Black Mamba social chatter lit up the boards. The site transformed from Kobe to Black Mamba in the first quarter. Notifications went out across Facebook, Twitter, RenRen, and Weibo. Over two million fans have visited NikeBasketball.com to watch Kobe transform into the Black Mamba. Night in and night out, the site continues to reflect Kobe's transformation on the court. The Black Mamba may strike without warning, but not without reward for the fans across the world. I made that mistake because I was trying to use the, uh, the pointer, the laser pointer, to catch Faris's beard on fire. <laughs> I want to see if I could get all the animals that live in your dreads out. <laughs> so unfortunately, uh, anyway, so the, the first example was, was, uh, was the Google Wallet example where uh, if we're designing media and we're designing all these media moments that interact with each other where you can enter you know, either through a story or through information or through a community or something, then you're going to have to build out as an agency all of these different disciplines. And the, Go the Google example was meant to illustrate that, that we had brand, brand designers, we had uh, event designers, we had social media people, interface designers. Um, uh, we had this whole sort of suite of different nodes uh, of, uh, of, of aptitude working to sort of create this sort of big holistic thing. The second one, the, uh, the Kobe one, was uh, similarly, we were sort of designing media so that we could get that sweet spot, which was play, where people could see that their interaction with the media was affecting the world, right? And in this case, was changing the, the content. So going back, this is what we do. The last thing I'm going to talk about is buying stuff, right? Because really, we are ultimately in the business of growing our clients' business, right? If we're not doing that, then we're sort of wasting everyone's time. Um, so, so we're back with our, our company and our audience here. Uh, and most of the Fortune 500 companies uh, started with creating one product, right? Creating one very innovative, interesting product. And in the 1800s, three things created scale to these products. The first thing was man mass manufacturing. Uh, second thing was mass transport, and the third thing was mass media. And those things grew these singular regional companies to a sort of national and then ultimately international scale. And then the real growth came from this thing uh, where they just kept adding products, right? So we have this sort of diversified uh, portfolio of products. That's how you grow companies, right? That's how you grow. And, and economists call it horizontal integration. 
And a sort of classic example of it would be Coca-Cola, when this pharmacist in Atlanta came up with this, this black, sticky, medicinal sort of drink. He'd send, he would sell 10 of them a day until he grew the business with those three things. And then the business really became global and huge when they started to diversify, when they created more and more products, horizontally integrated these more, more products. Um, and they've got now 500 products, and Pepsi is trying to keep up with them by creating something similar. So this is how businesses grew. And if you look at all the Fortune 500 companies, whether it's P&G, General Electric, or that this is how they grew, horizontally. And now there's another way that they've been able to grow, and that's vertical integration, when they buy up the supply chain. Right? A classic vertical integration company would be uh, Exxon, who takes the oil out, refines it, um, and, and then delivers it and sells it. Right? Coke is buying up bottlers as a, as a way to sort of um, uh, to, to vertically integrate. But we're not interested in vertical integration, we're interested in horizontal integration because each time they create a new brand, we get to do an ad, <laughs> right? But there's a problem with this. So just as media has become commoditized because there's so much of it and we have this myriad of screens that we're trying to manage, products have just become just commoditized. It's just so many of them. It's just so easy to manufacture them, to market them, and this is what we're faced with now. And all of our clients in the mature markets are saying the same thing, that this growth model is not working anymore. And there's only so much you can do from a vertical integration point of view. So we started to realize that there was, some, there was a new growth model. And a few companies have stumbled upon it inadvertently. We've been lucky enough to be involved in one of them. Um, and, and there isn't a term for it, so we've termed our own. But basically what it is is when there's a, the product that the user uh, 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 first uses is then that, is that enhanced by further products, right? Until they're surrounded with products and services, which are basically connected with media, right? They're connected with software. This is a new way to grow. Now, we like to call it functional integration. We think it'll catch on. Functional integration. It's lovely, very sexy, TM, right? And the, the, the best example of fun functional integration, uh, and we can't do a, a presentation without mentioning, is Apple, right? So when Jobs got, went back to Apple, um, they had 2% of the PC market. They were a dying company. And I'm not sure that Jobs knew what he was doing when he launched on this sort of functional integrated thing. I'm sure he didn't. But he should have created a model which has now turned Apple into the most valuable company in the world, right? And it started with the release of OS X in uh, 2000, I think it was, uh, with the iTunes software. Uh, where you could rip your, your CDs. Um, and then soon after, they came up with this uh, iPad, uh, iPod. You know. So all of a sudden, it made perfect sense if you already had, an app, had a Mac or if you had bought an iPod to buy into the other nodes because each of the nodes makes the other thing more valuable. Right? Functionally, they add up to more when they're coupled and they're all connected. And we know the story. The, the iPhone came out in 2007. And originally, Jobs didn't want to have an app store because he wanted, he's such a control freak, he didn't want to have um, anyone else developing software for Apple. Thank God he was convinced otherwise because now he's created a whole new industry, which is how to live life through a screen in your pocket, right? which is the app store. Um, and then they've added these other things, iPads, and, and, you know, and so connected, right? So we have this sort of functional integrated world going on. A guy called, uh, this, there's a Silicon Valley uh, a venture capitalist company called Anderson Horowitz. And Mr. Mr. Anderson uh, wrote this great uh, article, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal last year, called Software is Eating the World, where he described how software is eating not just the media world that I've just gone through, but everything else. So now the automotive world, you're going to make more a decision on buying a car in the future, more on the services that surround it than you will the hardware. So again, the experience as opposed to the object. BMW has now created this whole suite of software and, and smart keys. Uh, Honda has a suite of applications in Japan which are making people be more loyal to, to buying Honda cars. I mean, the cars themselves are just computers now. No one can fix a car anymore because you need to be a, you know, a, a computer engineer to do that. But this is not just automotive, finance, right? Goldman Sachs is going after the same people as Google now. Because finance has been software for a while. Even packaged goods, if there's a lifestyle uh, attached to it, whether it's you know, cleaning products or spices, 
there's a light, there, is, there, there are tools and there are experiences that could be enabled by software, right? And so we inadvertently started to create a functionally integrated world with Nike. So Nike was a, a shoe and apparel company. And we created this little thing called Nike Plus about five years ago. Um, on the heels of, the, uh, uh, of Plus, we came out with a lot of hardware that created the, the, sort of the, the system that, that delivered the experience, um, which included things like an app, you know, a, a GPS app, a sport watch. Um, and so in that, in that journey, you know, from, from making Plus into this sort of integrated thing, we created six million uh, registered users, right, very quickly. And we took Nike from a company that was third in the running category behind ASICS and New Balance to number one again. Not because their shoes were different, but because the experience was different. And now Nike is more, they, they, they compete less with those people, more with, with, uh, with RunKeeper and Fitbit and all these Silicon Valley software companies, right? So earlier this month, uh, we added another node to the Nike Plus experience, and that is the Fuel Band. And this is the first all-day tracker uh, that is connected to Plus, right? Um, it's, uh, it's a very sexy little object, and our team, it, we have 150 people working just on digital sport for Nike. Uh, and our team is embedded in Portland with them, and, and we work with the industrial designers, and we design the experience. Right? As an agency, we are an agency. Our agencies work in media. Media is the experience. You should do it too. We're helping to grow Nike. When they announced uh, uh, the fuel ban, Nike's stock price went up, right? It broke $100, $100 per, per share for the first time. Here's a little video. The entire insight behind the Nike Plus fuel ban is motivation. People want to be motivated. We want to make it really easy to stay motivated and stay more active. The premise itself is very simple. You wear the band on your wrist, you set yourself a daily goal, and the band helps you keep it. You're moving and walking and active in ways that you're probably not recognizing yet. And Nike Plus Fuel Band Experience starts to give me a measure of how active I am and how much my body is traveling throughout the day. It's really easy to use the band. There's only one button. You see your Nike Fuel, and the color display moves from red through yellow, and when you hit your goal, you hit green. It also displays your calorie burn, how many steps you've taken throughout the day, and of course, it shows what time it is. There's a USB connection designed and built into the band so that you can charge it at any computer, so no extra cable required. When we developed Nike Fuel, we were looking for a common metric that made it easier for anyone who's active to compare themselves with someone else who's active. The motion sensor in the band is able to track your everyday movement, so it's much easier for you to know when you're most active and what it will take for you to do more. You can't improve what you can't measure. The Nike Plus Fuel Band is designed with the ability to have Bluetooth in it, so you can wirelessly sync your data into the Nike Plus mobile app. You see per day, per week, per month, or per year, how active you've been, where you've been active, and where you have not. So you can use that as a way to keep staying motivated. How many days in a row can I get to green? The idea that I'm consistently getting to green and getting on streaks can be a lot of fun. So it can be 10 o'clock at night, and you see you're only 100 low on Nike fuel. So instead of going straight to bed, you make sure you hit your goal and continue that streak. On the website, we take advantage of the bigger screen, so we can get you deeper into your experience and make it even more interesting and fun. And as we evolve the experience, you'll be able to see much more of what your friends are doing, you can compare with them, and you'll be able to share your progress with them. The band itself is very clean, very simple. Um, everything on it has a reason. We did a lot of work with the fit, so that when you put this on, it's gonna feel like, it fits like a glove. We're particularly excited to create an experience that will help motivate people and help them do more. From the band on your wrist, to your phone, to the web, is this chain of inspiration, unlike anything we've ever seen before. So after that, we announced a few months afterwards, uh, Nike Plus, basketball Nike Plus, um, training, 
which is basically a technology uh, where we've got, hang on a sec, hang on a sec, here we go, ah, oh, ah, oh, oh, I've lost control, here we go, here, so as you can see, this is a Nike Plus basketball, if, and on the soles there are these, these four sensors that can measure uh, your movement, elevation, uh, and so on, the interface looks something like this, so you've, you've got your vertical, uh, you've got the amount of fuel you burn, and you've got your quickness. Um, and sort of importantly, um, that fuel thing uh, is, is what's tying this whole ecosystem together. Introducing it's Nike Plus Training, your new personal trainer, ready to serve up inspiration every day from the world's best athletes. Built-in sensors in your Nike Plus Training shoes. Right, you, get, you get the idea. We're running out of time, so I'm just going oh, to yeah, go to the Nike website to see that. But anyway, so there, there is this sort of technology inside a shoe. The important piece, though, is, as I said before, fuel, right? So the thing that ties all of these products and services together now is this currency that now Nike uh, sort of owns, right, which is fuel. Now, it measures activity. You, there was nothing else before this that measured activity. Calories is not a good measure of activity because if I'm a fat bastard, right, and I compete against a very small person. If we do the same thing, I'm going to burn more calories. That's not fair. So fuel is a sort of a normalized currency where activity is, is just measured uh, sort of equally. And that's the thing that sticks all this together, right? And as I said before, when we started this journey, we didn't think, oh, we're going to create a functionally integrated system. It has sort of un unfolded that way. But sort of going back to what I think we do in this industry, right? We still do this. We still use media to get attention so people buy stuff, but we use media for something else now because media is software, right? And we are in the media business, right? We also use media to innovate, right? And then to communicate. And when we innovate, hopefully, we decommoditize products, these sort of dumb products sitting by themselves. We make them better, and we make our, our clients' companies more valuable. And then they keep us. They don't fire us. I think I'm done. Thank you.